I was one of the 13 founding members of the University of Washington a Black Student Union. We actually had our first uh, announcement, our coming out party, if you will, in front of the hub on January 6th, where we announced that we're the Black Student Union, that uh, we see ourselves as, as uh, community students, and by that we meant Although we were on the campus, our accountability was to the black community and that we see that our only purpose on this campus is to work and prepare ourselves to be more effective at bringing about black power. <clears throat> that was our first meeting. That was the beginning. Uh, but the, the thing that generated it is that about 30 young black youth from Seattle had gone to a black youth conference over Thanksgiving weekend in 1967, where we got exposed uh, to some really revolutionary uh, youth from California who had already at San Francisco State, University of San Francisco, University of California, had already set up uh, or stu black student organizations that they called black student unions. We got our name from them. We got our purpose from them. We got our, uh, you know, sets of original sets of demands to consider from the California BSUs. It was also at that conference that we got exposed to uh, another group of revolutionary dynamic youth that had a profound impact on us. And that was the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense that had been born in Oakland in the fall of 1966. We had never heard of them. So, um, Suffice it to say, we were really inspired, really motivated to come back to Seattle and get even more involved in uh, working for black power in our home uh, community. So that was the beginning. When I started the University of Washington in 1964, I was a junior uh, returning from a year in Vista. And I had uh, joined Vista in the winter of 1966, because being in the Domestic Peace Corps, and that's what VISTA was known as, uh, you could get a deferment. And I was very concerned about being drafted and going into the Vietnam War. And even though I wasn't very political in 66, 65, 66, I knew that I did not want to go to the war, and I began to investigate alternatives that would allow me to stay out of jail and not have to go to Canada. Uh, so I joined VISTA. And I was sent from Central Seattle as a VISTA volunteer to work in Central Harlem. So that experience had the most profound revolutionary impact on me than anything else ever had in my life at that time. So uh, I went, uh, I was 20 years old when I went to uh, New York City as a VISTA volunteer. And I was, I would have characterized myself as a young, uh, individualistically ambitious uh, Negro student. Notice I didn't say black, but I came back from Vista after spending a year in Harlem, about 15 months after Brother Malcolm X had been killed, but his philosophy was extremely dominant in Harlem uh, at that time. Uh, when I returned, I would characterize myself as a black revolutionary. I had a big natural. I was wearing dark shades, dashiki. I changed my name in New York from Larry Gossett to Abba Yoruba, and I began to read and critically look at racism and capitalism vastly differently than I'd ever looked at our society before. And as a result of my year in um, Vista, and returning back to my home community, I said I wanted to be involved in the, in the black power movement in my home community because I got exposed and inspired and taught and limitedly involved while I was in Harlem and wanted to return. So when I got off the plane to return to the University of Washington as a junior, I uh, was already looking for ways in which I could have an impact on the black youth movement in my home community. And there wasn't one when I left. If there had not been anything happening here, since I was born and raised in Seattle, I was going to start some kind of black youth organization. But fortunately, when I re uh, returned, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, 
chapter in Seattle had been established, and E.J. Brisker and Carl Miller, uh, Verlaine Miller's first husband, uh, were the leaders of that organization. I just joined them, and then all of us somehow, both of them had gotten accepted into the University of Washington, so we were ready for winter quarter 68. That was the year all over the world, uh, you know, Czechoslovakia, Western Europe, uh, Vietnam, um, third world countries, uh, African liberation struggles. Uh, there was, uh, you know, ch people moving for change, revolutionary change, transformation of their social conditions. Uh, everybody, the youth in America, uh, black and a lot of white youth, not necessarily because they were concerned about racism, but uh, they had become anti-imperialist because of their objection to the war in Vietnam, and all those things were coalescing at the same time, particularly on college campuses where people were thinking about the world and what w was going to be their role in it. Yeah, so that's that all was, was happening at that time. I mean, I can remember in 68, 69, 70, because I was still on the campus finishing up, uh, but the Black Student Union uh, leadership used to meet with the leadership of the student for students for a democratic society. Then later in 69, 70, when the Seattle Liberation Front was born, we would meet with Chip Marshall and all these white radicals. And all of us, we were actually, we would meet and plan out taking state power or taking control in Seattle in three or four years. That's, you know, that's how we were naive but we were also very committed and felt that our nation had to change if it was to benefit all of its uh, people. So it was a, a very unusual time, very different uh, from now. It would, and by 1970, um, when we had several hundred more black students going to University of Washington, because in 68 the Black Student Union did research and found there was only 63 black students on this campus out of 32,000. We found that there were only two African-American uh, professors out of uh, 2,100. Uh, we found that of the 3,000 main course offerings in arts and humanities, not only did no, no class deal with the black experience, we couldn't even find one professor or instructor that used a book written by or about African-Americans, Asians, Native Americans, or Latinos. So we charged this university with being institutionally racist. It wasn't a concept at that time that President Odegaard, the faculty senate, and certainly a lot of the white students had ever heard. And it kind of scared them. It bothered them. Uh, and they didn't under Odegaard at one time told us when we were meeting with him, I don't understand why you all are so angry because this is not, Alabama, you do not have a president or a governor standing and blocking your entrance into the University of Washington, said he. Uh, but our retort was that nothing affirmative, though, Dr. Odegaard, is being done on this campus or in this state uh, um, to make this university or this state's government more accountable to the needs of black people. And we are, in fact, excluded maybe more indirectly uh, than what occurs uh, in Alabama, but the effect is the same. There's not any of us here. There's the educational uh, structure and offerings don't respond to us. They don't uh, create, there's no creation of a multi-ethnic, integrated, more truthful picture of what American life historically and contemporarily has been all about so that people really understand, it's got to change. And he you know, kind of understood what we were saying. He just couldn't understand why we wanted it to occur so fast. And he was trying to get us to see that in the university communities, change can occur, but it has to be very incremental. And uh, E.J. Brisker, our, our vice president, actually Verlaine Keith Miller's brother, was actually elected the first president of the Black Student Union, E.J. the vice president, but E.J. was still intellectually, emotionally, and experience-wise, because he had been in SNCC 
and, and, and worked with Martin Luther King in the South for the, the previous four or five years before he moved uh, to Seattle. He, he was, you know, he was our leader, and he, it was he that said, Dr. Odegaard, the university is 107 years old, man, and if you can't do better than 63 black students out of 32,000 and nothing in, curricular, uh, in terms of curricular offerings, dealing with the black experience, it's racist, it's got to change, and we're telling you it's got to change now. So that was that was the, the, the dynamic. And it led to, in May, just four months after our birth, uh, us organizing uh, a demonstration aimed at taking over uh, President Charles Odegaard's office in the administration building. And it was on a weekend where our intelligence, albeit false, had informed us that the governor was going to be on the campus. During those days, in the latter part of March, the governor would have some kind of ceremonial thing with the president, and it was something that the university really looked forward to, and there was going to be press, and we thought that would be an ideal time to take over the university administration building because the governor would be there, and we had decided that the governor and the president were going to stay there until our demands were uh, met. Uh, but when we went there, um, only President Odegaard was there, but he was meeting with the faculty senate, 12 men. I mean, for women, even at that time in 68, there weren't any women in leadership positions on the University of Washington uh, campus, you all. Uh, but that's who we met with. And it was about 150 of us. I don't know, Dr. Odegaard never thought about the fact that if there's only 63 students on the campus and only 15 or 20 in the Black Student Union, then where did all these black youth come from? I told you all when we announced our existence, we said we are part and parcel of the black community. We're not some elite get an opportunity to get a college education so we can get away and become like white middle class people. No, that wasn't us. So we worked with uh, setting up black student unions in January, February at, the, at Garfield High School, Franklin High School, Rainier Beach, and Cleveland, and then at the junior high level at Asa Mercer, uh, Washington, uh, Meany, uh, and Sharpless uh, Junior High. They didn't call them middle school, they were all junior high schools. So we had a lot of black youth that were involved. And we had kept in contact with the um, Black Panther Party leaders in Oakland, and by April uh, they had agreed that a chapter of the uh, Black Panther Party could be established in, in Seattle. And uh, some of our young uh, members of the BSU, uh, led by Aaron Dixon, uh, took the lead in organizing uh, the Black Panther Party chapter in Seattle. So by the time we had the sit-in, uh, hundreds of black youth had joined the high school BSUs and the Black Panther Party. And it was about 150 of them that came out and supported us. Uh, when we said we're going to take over the university, we might go to jail, uh, but we determined to uh, get some power on that campus and we need y'all's support, and they responded. But luckily, in my estimation, um, both for the university and for us, because uh, several of us had started going to jail, Carl Miller um, and I uh, and Aaron Dixon had organized the Black Student Union at Franklin, and then by March, the, university, the, the principal had begun to kick black girls out of school for wearing their hair natural and writing a note saying, you do not look ladylike, so you don't straighten your hair anymore to look white, so you can't come to the back to Franklin High School until you look ladylike. It's just an outrageous racist conduct in our opinion. So the students were very angry. We organized them and they took over Franklin in the first sit-in in Seattle, March 29, 1968. And the city fathers, the mayor, the city council, the superintendent of schools, 
Forbes bottom. They were so upset. They said this kind of stuff doesn't happen in Seattle. What's wrong with our young Negroes? It must be because the outside agitators are influencing them. Not the conditions of Seattle, but outside agitators. So I got called an outside agitator, and I was born in Seattle in the 1940s. Uh, but that was the situation at that time. Then on April 4, 1968, they arrested Carmel. Miller, Aaron Dixon, and I for the sit-in at Franklin because they said the students would have never done anything like that if it weren't for you blacks from the University of Washington. So on April 4th, we were arrested, put in jail. That same afternoon at about 1.30, we heard on the news that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had been assassinated. All that kind of stuff was going on a month and a half before the sit-in. So we hadn't even gone to court. And the prosecuting attorney, Charles O'Carroll, was so upset that he sent his chief deputy, Neil Shulman, out to the university begging uh, Dr. Odegaard's secretaries, administrative assistants, please get the word in, Dr. Odegaard, don't give in to these people. I want them in jail. This is a deputy prosecuting attorney saying this. And, uh, and fortunately, though, as I said before, after four hours sit-in, uh, the five basic demands that we uh, put forth, uh, Dr. Odegaard signed off on them. And they, I mean, they might have seemed revolutionary then. In retrospect, they weren't. They were basic reforms. That the university would set up the first affirmative action program in Washington State and recruit more black, Latino, Asian, low-income Asian, because there were already a lot of Asians there, and Native Americans and poor whites. We had class consciousness, which made us kind of unique from other black student unions around the country, because they were very nationalistic, Most, many of the others. I don't want to say all. But up here, I don't know why, we, we read, we were very influenced by uh, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels and Mao Zedong, so we were more internationalists, and we said the oppressed, regardless of race, ought to benefit from its public higher ed institution. So that's why in our demands uh, that we said we wanted poor whites to be uh, served, one. Two, that there be a black studies program set up on this campus. Three, that you can't bring uh, a lot of students of color out here. We use the term third world students. So the television audience might not know what third world, so I'll say youth of color, out here and not have a, a academic, social, and cultural uh, structure that they feel comfortable with or they, they may be uh, so alienated that they might not be able to successfully complete their university education. So uh, we demanded a, a, a learning resource center, email Petrie is now had, at least up until the last couple of years, the director of the Learning Resource Center, which is hooked on to the Ethnic Cultural Center on 40th in Brooklyn, where from 68 down, from 70 when it was built down to today, uh, that has become a cultural outlet for creative uh, culturalist students uh, who are black, Asian, Latino, Native American, and progressive white who want to use that. And then across the street, the Ethnic Cultural Center where the black student union, the Chicano student, the Asian student, and the Native American student all have their own rooms, and there's a library down there. All those are in the, our demands. And then uh, fourth, that there be more black staff, from professors to counselors to administrators hired by the university. And fifth, that we be represented on every policymaking body on the campus. And we were pretty audacious because we said, including the Board of Trustees, we want to be represented on that level, too. So that, that, was, that's, that was our demands. Odegaard signed off, and the rest is history, as they say. He put us on policy bodies, like he put us on the advisory committee he set up to set up a, a, a black studies program. He put us on the policy body to set up what eventually became known as the Office of Minority uh, Affairs. He put us on a few other bodies that stu no students, white or black, had ever been on. 
but we never were successful at getting a seat on the board of trustees. I don't even think he had the uh, capacity to sign off on that. No, it, it, it didn't lead to that. But we were represented and on, on committees, on bodies that made decisions that impacted our lives, and we felt that we were responsible enough to represent our community in those various capacities. It is very difficult for white people then as well as now, I haven't seen a great change, to understand what this concept of white racism means. They do not perceive that they have a lot of privileges over people of color. I mean, that's why just five years ago in 1998, the overwhelming majority of black voters voted to kill affirmative action in this state. This is only the second state that that has been uh, done in. It, it is normal to most people that people that make decisions about, you know, who gets hired or white people who, are, are, you know, run television studios are white. People who own most of the businesses uh, are white. Most of the employees in the better jobs are white. And the ones on the lower end jobs are people of color. They don't think that much about why that is. And if you start saying that uh, it has to change and we want a certain representation on all the levels of society, that is quite different than what the standard is. And then it's easy for them to respond to demagogues that might want to take advantage of that. Uh, well, they're not qualified. Why should we uh, give them that? I mean, white students, we would go into their into classes between that January and May period and say this is an institutionally racist campus and the curriculum is racist. They honestly did not know what are you talking about. We'd go into a colonial, uh, American colonial history class, I remember, because I was one of the three black students that went in there and the professor said, well, may I help you? And we said, we came in here to help you, man. He said, well, I don't remember inviting you. You didn't. We invited ourselves. We're going to teach the class. And uh, we had prepared before then, and part of it was shock, but we were trying to get the white students and the professors to think about what we mean by black studies, what we mean by integrating curriculum so that you are teaching the truth. We got up in front of the uh, Eddie Demings got up in front of this class and and uh, told the, the students, you guys are in here learning about old George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and, uh, and uh, learning how these are your forefathers. To us, they're not our forefathers. They were much more likely to be our daddies than our forefathers. George Washington had 13 children, none of them by Martha. I bet you all didn't know that. Had we lived during that time, we would have been working from sun up to sundown for no pay. How this going to be our forefather? Have you ever thought of that? Thomas Jefferson had seven kids by this woman named Sally Hemings. All of them, he worked as slaves throughout their entire life, even though they were his kids. How this going to be our forefather? And our forefathers during that time was Christmas Attox, the first person to die in the Revolutionary War was an African-American from Boston. Our forefathers were Peter Salem and Salem Poor, black men who asked that blacks be allowed to fight on the side of the, of the, of, of the uh, you know, the, the Washington Army. Uh, our forefathers during that period of time was Richard Allen, the founder of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, that said black people should be able to go to church and not being humiliated by whites, by having to stay out of their churches or only wait in the basement, you know, be able to come together in the basement. So we're going to start our own Methodist religion. And then during the constitutional writing period in Philadelphia, Richard Allen mobilized demonst black demonstrators uh, that picketed and put pressure uh, on Convention Hall to say, what about us? How come there's no black man? Uh, and I don't know if he said black women, I think he said black men, uh, involved in the writing of the, uh, of the Constitution of the United States of America. Aren't we people too? How come we can't learn about them as part of our colonial 
history. That's why we say it's racist, y'all. And then we would leave, or, you know, because they were, it was interesting. White privilege is a reality in the United States of America. Many whites have not taught, they've not thought about the fact that they have privilege. They don't think they have privilege. They think that they work for what they got, and it's kind of insulting to them to hear people say that they got uh, privileges over somebody else. Or they'll say slavery was back then. We can understand that. But they don't understand the dynamic uh, reflections of the legacy of slavery that still are with us today and how that manifests itself with the condition of, of a lot of black people, particularly uh, the black poor in our uh, society. They just don't get it. They think that if those people would work hard like us, they could get anything that they want. It's, it's very difficult to deal with the issue of race in America then and 68 as well as now. It's the whole thing that I talk a lot about when I'm asked to uh, speak on, on Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy and contributions to this country because people readily relate to uh, the efforts that he made in 1955 to 65 when the Voting Rights Bill was passed because to separate and segregate people by color and have colored water fountains and white water fountains, white bathrooms and colored bathrooms, white schools and colored schools, listing and paper Negro jobs and white jobs, all this stuff was done. They could see how visually horrible that kind of racial uh, division and subjugation was. And they could readily kind of relate to it. Uh, particularly when six, after Martin made his I Have a Dream speech, after the kids in Birmingham were hosed, when he allowed thousands of black students in Birmingham, Alabama, it was really an amazing part of our history that's still not talked about a lot. So many adults had gone to jail in Birmingham that Martin couldn't get anybody else by the end of April, and he had to turn to the schools to be successful at desegregating the most segregated city in the South. And the kids responded by the hundreds. And they learned his lesson about being nonviolent and loving those who are oppressing you, but not loving the oppression. Uh, so, and then whites related to that, they said it's horrible. They wrote articles and letters. They put pressure on President Kennedy. Led to the passage of the Civil Rights Bill in 64, and the voting right. They can see, why should somebody black, just because they're black, not be able to vote? White supporters, the voting rights bill. But 66, 68, when Martin Luther King started moving into urban northern ghettos and for open housing and for jobs, the struggle became much more subtle. Whites had a much more difficult time understanding what is this, what does he mean by uh, economic uh, justice and that blacks have been discriminated against uh, for housing or all the institutions are racist or that all poor people need to get together and take over our whole Congress and not allow it to function into a, a plan to eliminate poverty is developed. They, that was much harder for them to grasp. And Martin Luther King was despised and hated by far more people in 1968 when he died uh, than was the case in 63 and 64 because he had built this national following. Uh, but he was talking about some pretty radical changes in 67, 68 when he came out against the war and against poverty in general. It's more subtle. Subtler is harder to deal with. It's still a problem today. We've made a lot of progress, but people have a difficult time uh, when people say that, uh, you know, it's not right that 30% of all African Americans today are poor and something has to be done about it. They said, well, we did something back in 64 and 65. They should have to work like us now. It is. It's the, the subtle um, manifestations of racial division in this country are very difficult for many folks uh, to deal with.
uh, today. Between uh, 1968 and 75, the African American population on the University of Washington campus grew from 63 students in 68 to about a uh, thousand um, in 75, tenfold, more than tenfold. Same kind of uh, changes were being made across the country because of the impact of the Civil Rights Movement, the Black Power era, and the advent of affirmative action in the, in the early uh, 70s. Uh, you know, uh, flexible admissions criteria and priority for people who are poor to get financial aid and those kinds of special efforts that were being made to make sure it's some people of color had opportunity to get uh, a, a college education. And a lot of people in society uh, supported that. After about 75 or 77, there were a lot of political changes being made in our uh, society. Um, you know, less activism on the campus from black and white students. It just, maybe it was the beginning of the me first-ism coming into being, I don't know, late 70s, early 80s. A lot of poor people. In 77, uh, I read a book recently by this guy named Loeb. He's a writer from Seattle. I'm sorry that right now his first name escapes me. Uh, it's very telling. He said, that in 1977, 27% of all uh, black students who went to college were poor. Today, and, well, 2001, it had been dramatically re reduced to only 4% of low income black students have an opportunity to go to college uh, today in this country. And uh, the reasons that he laid out is that we don't have the militancy of the students. There's been a gradual reduction in commitment to affirmative action. Uh, uh, poor students don't get preferential treatment in terms of financial aid uh, because conservative presidents have wanted to appeal to the middle class and said that, you know, we got to be more flexible on who gets financial aid and we got to make it more of a loan rather than a grant so people have to pay it back. All of these things worked against talented youth of color uh, having the same chance to get an education as their moms and pops did back in the late 70s. So we actually, and this surprises me, have a situation today where a poor kid at, at Rainier Beach or Garfield or Franklin much less likely, even if he or she desires, to have the economic, academic um, support mechanism that will help him or her get into the University of Washington uh, today than he would have had if he or she entered in the fall of 1970, where there was we were reaching out to them, putting up support structures, giving them priority consistency consideration because we wanted to do something about the historical legacy of racial oppression in this country. But it hasn't been, it didn't get solved by 75. So that's why we have the kind of issues that we're dealing with today. A lot of progress, still have a ways to go. I went, uh, uh, real quickly, I went to the 25th anniversary of the Education Opportunity Program with Verlaine Keith, who I understand you talked to earlier. And uh, Kath Lane Russell, another original member of the Black Student Union. And we were honored um, uh, because uh, they said in, in 25 years uh, uh, on this campus, at, on the University of Washington campus, there had been about 52,000 students of color who had graduated. This doesn't count all the ones that went for one, two, or three years, but who had graduated. And of those 52,000, 55% of them had entered through the Office of Minority Affairs Educational Opportunity Program and gotten their college degrees. That's about 27, 28,000 people uh, from, from 1970 to 95 who wouldn't have gotten access to this great institution had it not been for this uh, affirmative action program and this uh, movement on this campus that black students in the late 60s 
sacrifice to develop and carry through. Uh, and that was very rewarding. So, you know, the black middle class in, in Seattle in 1968 probably was about 15% of the entire black community. Today, it's about 35% are in the middle class. And that's because of the legacy of programs like the EOP. But we still have the dynamic of 30% of the black population in Seattle still living below poverty and 40% of all the youngsters who are 18 or younger being in those households. The challenge is still there. We have a ways to go. We've made progress. And I hope from programs like this, we can learn about what's happening and maybe think more clearly uh, and progressively, in my uh, opinion, about what we have to do in the future to make uh, our university and our community a better place for all people to live in.